a reading from 1 Thessalonians. Rejoice always, pray without ceasing, give thanks in all circumstances, for this is the will of God in Christ Jesus for you. Do not quench the spirit, do not despise the words of prophets, but test everything, hold fast to what is good, abstain from every form of evil. May the God of peace himself sanctify you entirely, and may your spirit and soul and body be kept sound and blameless at the coming of our Lord Jesus Christ. The one who calls you is faithful, and he will do this. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. It was an epic fail at Christmas yard art. Another example I can use with my wife to defend not putting up holiday outdoor decorations. Three big lighted letters were supposed to stand side by side spelling out the seasonal word, except the first letter fell over. So passers-by who looked that way saw oi rather than joy. That's oi as in the Yiddish word, which means something like, oh my, I can't believe how horrible things are right now. And a lot of us are feeling more oi than joy right now, right? We're nine months into COVID-19 pandemic restrictions. We've all had the virus or know someone who's had the virus. We may know someone who's died of it. As a matter of fact, 68 million people worldwide have contracted the virus and more than a million and a half have died of it. 300,000 of them in the United States. More people now are dying every single day in this country from COVID-19 than were lost on Pearl Harbor or on 9-11. Our everyday lives have been disrupted in a way that none of us has ever seen. We long to see one another in person, to worship together in this place again, to hug and to kiss one another without fear or embarrassment. We will never again take for granted our intimate gatherings. Oi is our indicative predicament. And yet the apostle tells us in our lesson today that joy, not oi, is our Christian imperative. Joy is also the word of the day on this third Sunday in the season of Advent, which is also known as Gaudete Sunday from the Latin for rejoice. This is the Sunday the candle color changes from purple to pink or Rose, if you're a stickler liturgically, you can see. It suggests the coming of the beloved one whom the Song of Solomon called the Rose of Sharon. Or maybe it's a reference to the blooming crocus in the desert that Isaiah had prophesied would be a sign of rejoicing to the people who lived in exile. Advent is a season of spiritual preparation during a time of existential exile. In the Middle Ages, it was a severe time of fasting and prayer in monasteries all over Europe. By the third week of this, even the most dedicated monks needed a break, a little joy for their oi, don't you know? And we all need a little joy right now, don't we? Paul even says we do. He declares that rejoicing, along with praying without ceasing and giving thanks in all circumstances, even during Advent, even during COVID, 
is the will of God in Christ Jesus for you. Think about that. Joy is the will of God for you. Now, I don't know about you, but this might strike you strange if you grew up in the church with lots of talk about God's will for your life. When I was a kid, I always hated the idea of God's will for my life. I always assumed that God's will for my life might be something that I would not will for myself if I had the choice, but I would have to accept it because it was God's will for my life. That God, I figured, would want me to do something like, I don't know, become a preacher instead of, say, a football star, which is what I really wanted for myself. And I never imagined that what God willed for me might actually be something that would bring me the kind of joy that I know in being your preacher. Hmm, go figure. And this just shows that our understanding of the will of God itself needs re-examining. The word will, as Father Robert Capon put it, has warm and cold streaks in it. We usually think of the will of God dressed up in German uniform and shouting commands. Kinta, you will clean up your room. You will go off to be a missionary for me. You will do your duty even if it makes you miserable. We get to thinking God's will for us is something stern and foreboding, like doing errands for God that will always amount for us to grudging obedience. We do them in order to avoid being called on the carpet by the cosmic commandant. But there's a sunny side to the street of this word will. It has a warmer feeling. God's will is God's desire. To speak of God's will for you is first and foremost, therefore, to speak of God's will for you. What God really wants is not all your little token sacrifices of time, talents, and service, or even your grand gestures of sacrifice. What God wants most is you. And so if we think of Paul's words here about rejoicing, being the will of God in Christ Jesus for you and me, we might have to think about God altogether differently. This is who our God is, a God who wills us joy. Just look at the Christmas story itself which includes the so-called Annunciation, which we will look at more closely next week, that ends with Mary having a stirring of joy within her. It leads to her exaltation of joy that we call the Magnificat. And we're told that the angels told the shepherds at Jesus' birth that this story, that this news was good news of great joy that should be to all people, everybody, as we like to say, around here. And our psalm of the day, Psalm 126, is filled with language of joy, shouts of joy over the memory of what God had done in delivering the people Israel from their long time of exile and restoring their fortunes. We should distinguish, though, between happiness and joy, even though there are times when they are one and the same thing. The word happiness is rooted in the root word hap, which means chance or circumstance. That, that means that happiness is a joy that comes when good things happen, good things take place. 
But we are told here to rejoice always and to give thanks in all circumstances, in all haps, you might say. In other words, joy is an inner condition of the soul that allows us to know the peace of God in all things and at all times. Graham Wood wrote a piece in the Atlantic back in July about his experience of going by himself to Disney World in Orlando right after they reopened the park with all the necessary COVID precautions. It was an eerie experience, he describes. There weren't many people there. He got to ride every single ride in the park in one single day. But the strangest thing, he said, was the facelessness of people because of the masks. Here's how he put it. The uncanny experience of the Magic Kingdom without Mickey and Pluto running up to shake your hand is nothing compared with the uncanny experience of the Magic Kingdom where many of the visitors wearing t-shirts that read the happiest place on earth without even a glimpse of the human face. Mask compliance at the parks was nearly perfect. What is an amusement park in which visible smiles are forbidden and laughter and screams of delight are muffled to the point of inaudibility? You do not fully appreciate the inhumanity of this situation, the strangeness of being in a place that exists to elicit joy wiped clean of all legible emotion. Here is an example of how circumstantial happiness is versus the enduring presence of joy that is a gift of God to us in Jesus Christ. Joy is the result of God's grace and we experience it as we meditate upon that gift of God and receive it. It's not loud and boisterous necessarily. It's more likely quiet gratitude that rises up within us to give thanks to God. Ludwig von Beethoven was smitten as a boy when he read the poem Ode to Joy that was penned by Friedrich Schiller. Schiller wrote the words on the brink of the French Revolution, which so excited him. Beethoven finally set them to music in his fourth and final movement to his final symphony, the ninth. You would recognize it immediately. Uh, we sing Ode to Joy in the church as the hymn tune, Hymn to Joy. And that tune is actually used for five different hymns in our current hymn book, the most uh, familiar of which I would say is Joyful, Joyful, we adore thee. Uh, it's also actually set to a hymn uh, by our own David Clanton's wife, uh, Jan Aldrich Clanton. Beethoven's tune is probably one of the most popular chosen for use at weddings. An Ode to Joy has been used for social and political movements across the past two centuries, some good and some not so. Uh, my own favorite time, though, was after the fall of the Berlin Wall, when the famed conductor Leonard Bernstein assembled an orchestra from east and west and gathered them at the Brandenburg Gate in Berlin to celebrate the unification of Germany. It continues now to be used by the European Union as the Confederacy's anthem not to replace the national anthems of the member countries, but to call forth joy at their union. I love to picture Beethoven himself. By this time in 1824, completely deaf, standing before the orchestra in Vienna, conducting the debut performance of his Ninth Symphony. While the instruments played the Ode to Joy, 
and thrilled the audience, bringing them to their feet with rejoicing, Beethoven himself could only feel the quiet joy of it in his heart. And when it was over and the orchestra had gone silent, Beethoven is said to have continued to wave and flail his arms as if continuing to conduct this peace because he was himself caught up in its unceasing joy. Someone had to turn him around at last so that he could see the radiant audience on their feet, unconsciously obeying the command of the apostle to rejoice. Sometimes rejoicing comes easy to us because we can't help but feel a glorious gladness in just being alive. And sometimes it feels like a duty because the world or we are in such a mess. But sometimes joy takes us by surprise because in the midst of an encroaching darkness of Advent's December or of the persistence of a maddening pandemic. The rose candle is lit. The organist holds a hopeful high note and the Christ child stirs in the soul as a gift of God, the gift of quiet joy.